Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Precog Time. Um, we are really lucky today to be talking with Sharzad Shangalve. Did I mispronounce your last name? I'm sorry. Yes. How do you? Huh? Perfect. Shangalve. Shangalve. Bye. 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 Yeah. Bye. Um, <laughs> who's uh, an artist whose work we've all been really um, obsessed with and interested in as a magazine for like four years now and is someone who we're really lucky to have had a conversation with now for many years um, about her work and her ideas and we just wanted to give a quick shout out to a show that Sharzad is going to open in August at Transmitter Gallery in Bushwick so for as we begin to slowly um, be allowed to see art again I hope everyone will go check that out even if it's only one at a time. Um, when does that open, Sharzad? I think August 6th, it should be. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, so we wanted to start, as always, just sort of asking you how you are and how you find yourself in these, like, really, um, at this point, still extraordinary, but, like, durationally long, weird times. Um. Thanks so much for giving me this opportunity. I mean, um, my interest in Precog has been going back, back, back <laughs> since the beginning. But of course, um, like seeing how you guys can provide this um, space for people to talk and have the conversations. And this is very precious, especially at this time. And the first email I got from you, I couldn't believe it was like the quarantine just started and you guys were like, oh, now we have this talk series. I was like, oh my God, this is pretty fast. That's amazing. Um, so yeah, I think it's been, I don't know, everybody has their own experience, but it has been a really weird experience of time, I guess. It's like, it's pretty much as if it's like one continuous unit of the time, not breaking at the same time, quite much breaking in, in so many ways. So, and I think, I don't know, for me, it's been, um, it, it things take longer and shorter. Things that they were <laughs> faster before are slower now and otherwise, but um, I got some, I got some time to have a chance to read things that I wanted to read. Um, watch things that I wanted to relax a little bit and I just realized how it is different not to use the subway every day. Is it changing how you think about your work? I think so. I think so. Like for the show that is coming, I've been actually thinking about, okay, this is a small room. People are going to visit, although it is by appointment and one person at a time, but what if, um, we still have to, like the way we think about a body and the distance of the body to other bodies, we're thinking about them, right? So I was thinking that, okay, I, how do I do this that people don't have to spend so much time in the gallery, although, and they feel safe. So I was thinking that maybe I should have something that they can just walk through it and go out without, you know, being forced to stay. I mean, they're welcome to, but, um, but yes, I was thinking about the body, about the distance, about, and you don't have to be worried about the opening night anymore because a lot of times you're avoiding thinking about that there is an opening or the opening because <laughs> we think like, okay, this much work, but then 200 people show up and you think like, okay, nobody's seeing anything, but that is not happening anymore. So I guess, yeah. Um. So, I mean, it's, it's really interesting um, because it feels as though um, a lot of your work when you do installations do have so much to do with directing, either directing people through a space or like almost directing art through um, a certain kind of space. And I was wondering if you could talk more about that, but also um, maybe as a way of framing your history that also seems related to signage, like clear signage and maybe a relationship to graphic design and spatial, mm -hmm. how we indicate, how we indicate language and meaning um, 
through graphics and maybe Kelly wants to hop in here, but um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit. <laughs> my <laughs> my <laughs> one question. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I think, I mean, I studied graphic design uh, in my undergrad in the University of Tehran, which is like one of the biggest and oldest universities in the city. Um, and I think, um, yeah, I, I wanted to be a graphic designer <laughs> since I was 10. It's funny because um, I was 10. I remember I was living in another city and on the TV show, um, suddenly I saw that there was a graphic design exhibition in our town. And I was like, oh my God, what is this? And I told my dad that, can we, can we go, can we go see that show? And then we went together and it was the opening of that show. And the TV came in, introduced uh, and interviewed my dad and said like, why are you here, sir? And he was like, oh, my girl, uh, she wanted to see the show and she insisted that we come. And I felt suddenly like being, being like, oh my God, this is amazing. And then I really loved the work, which were typography. And I thought, okay, that's what I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be a graphic designer. And um, I didn't study graphic design, um, but my main focus um, was on calligraphy, typography, and Persian lettering types. Um, I, my dad made me take lessons of calligraphy when I was a kid for a long, long time, and he couldn't tolerate our handwriting being bad. So, um, but um, it definitely made the way I think about art um, the way it is now. My, at the end of my education, I realized that um, as a typographer, I'm very interested in manipulating the, something that has a meaning, has like a very direct meaning, meaning words and texts. But at the same time, um, I wanna give it some space to be playful. So what happened is that I started making the types out of things and then taking pictures of them, making situation that this type and text would be a little bit playful. Like I made them out of ice and let them melt. I made them out of cardboards and let them flip. I made them out of running paint. And it is now that I understand that I always created a situation that was halfly controlled or was pretending to be in control, but it actually wasn't. I would never know how my posters would come out. I had like sketches, but I would never know that how the final result is going to be. So I think um, in that way, the process of thinking of like, um, graphic design you usually have like some sort of commissions right you have to make something for a certain purpose like it, usually at that time we were working on posters and then we knew that we need this poster for the show and these are the information that has to be included but i was always trying to find a way that it's um it's a little bit running from that certain box that is uh provided for um so yeah, these posters, all of them are basically photos. Um, this one is not a poster. This one is a picture of my, should I talk about that? Oh, um, if you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that one is a picture of my mom and dad, if we can go back. Um, this is the way they taught me how to read when I was two. They started showing me these cards that were words on them and showing me couple of new ones every day so this is how I started reading when I was like almost about to talk so talking and reading happened at the same time and I think my relationship with words were pretty much <laughs> intense um in my entire life <laughs> because of that <laughs> yeah um so yeah so all the posters are basically like a photo um and then I add some information um, like this one, that box is added later, but the 
main tidal that is read um, as like some sort of mountain um, landscape, which reads as hinterland in Farsi. Um, that's basically a photo. Um, or this one, um, that was that is a poster for a photo photo exhibition called The Other City, and the photographer was basically focusing on the margins, the the neighborhoods that are not quite they're the areas that are between the neighborhoods, the ones that you cannot tell whether this is Bed Stuy or Bushwick or this is like I don't know. This <laughs> And then, um, yeah, so the, the, the photo exhibition was about that. And I, and I basically took the title and made, the, made a negative space and shot out of the negative space, which is um, um, I wanted to ask you, so you have a series of photographs where people are holding up these letters um, yeah. that are like illuminated. Can you talk about what those words are? Yeah, so that photo series, um, I did it right after I finished undergrad and I realized I'm not sure what, um, what I'm doing is actually graphic design and then I was not, uh, I couldn't dare to start like calling them photos as well. <laughs> but I don't know, I, I was like, okay, I'm gonna just do this. I don't know what to call it, but I'm just gonna do this. And I made three words out of plexiglass and had the sign piece like the people who make signages made them for me and they were lit up with a battery um so the words read as man i which is translated as i or me this one it's tan which is body and another one is vatan this one is i like me um, and the last one is Vatan, which is motherland or homeland. And I took them to the street and I asked people to hold, to choose between them, hold them and look into the camera. Um, and I took them in 2009 and 2010. Um, and this one is just, the Vatan being packed up, sent abroad to some friends. Um, <laughs> and oh, never had. Oh no, you. Yeah. Oh, I was just gonna ask. Um, the way that you're talking about words, like learning language, and some of your design work is super. Um, like it, it talks about how language is not just concrete but physical. Mm -hmm. uh, and the materiality of the language and one of the first pieces of yours that um that i knew about that was also in um your your show with constanza that marcella and mariana interviewed you about for the magazine is a piece um that has the negative of your mouth yeah um that holds up images in this way where it's like the the sort of the space where language is made Mm -hmm. in relationship to like a placeholder for the imaginary or what we might be talking about and this relationship between the physicality of language um its materiality and images is really striking in your work um and i was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that and how you're thinking about this relationship um yeah i think the journey continued when I, I moved out of Iran and um, while I was naturally working with typography, calligraphy, I don't know, words, I suddenly realized that, I mean, I remember that my very first trip at the school, at the master's program, when I put my work in front of the viewers, I was like, I cannot do this. This is not going to work anymore. And it's funny because I couldn't realize that before putting them in front of their eyes but the moment they sat down I was like this is not gonna work um I realized that um I'm not interested in my new audiences to see the work and then go and read, read the title and say oh what does that mean oh that means this because the whole point was that I was trying to generate the meaning out of the materiality um, and it was not happening anymore. It was the, the, the time was um, caught between like them seeing the work and then 
realizing what it means. So I decided to stop working with Persian type and typography, al although it was um, something that I felt very much in comfort with, but I thought, um, I can't do this anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. And um, so I started thinking about the language in general and thinking about words and thinking about how language basically um, order things and orders us and how it basically um, is not a tool, but it is what we are. And also at the same time, I was thinking a lot about process because um, the way I was thinking about process was very different back in Iran regarding to what I was understanding here. Um, the mainly, I would say that material, um, the way you perceive the material and the way you think with the material is pretty much different. Um, so I started thinking about the process um, a bit more. I remember that the first day of school, um, I was like, so what do we do? And one of my second year said, um, so we go to Home Depot and buy stuff. And I was like, mm, okay. So we went to Home Depot. <laughs> we went to Home Depot and I was, it was my, it was one of my first culture shocks. I was like, oh my God. So everything, the fact that everything was on the same shelves, it was so not acceptable. I was like, so how does it matter? I can grab sand or I can grab like, wood or I can grab anything. I can be interested in anything and nothing really is better than the others. And so um, I was really confused because it wasn't something that I, I was used to. Um, Over there, would you just have one store just for cement and one store? Yeah, you go to the bazaar and you go like to the section of like those people who do the welding and you just have to negotiate with this guy who does the thing that you want and then you go to the other section of the bazaar. I don't know. It was yeah. seeing everything being there and I just have to say, I want this. And then it's there. It was just, <laughs> it was, I couldn't, I couldn't, um, I suddenly realized that what matters is my interest. And then I was like, so what is my interest? I really don't know. I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> and then so I randomly bought a lot of things and came back to the studio. And then I really stared at them for two days. And then I was like, I, I'm, I just tried to be interested in something, but at the same time, I was just thinking a lot about urge and um, the arbitrariness of things. Like I was thinking about like, it has to come out of an urge. This is how it has to work. And then I started thinking about uh, um, suddenly the process of talisman making. Talisman is like, coming from the Islamic culture, but every culture has it in different names. It means that making this charm or spell that is gonna make something happen. Like you wish for something and you going through a very on surface weird and unrelated process for making something happen. So for me, it was more like, I mean, in Islamic, Islamic talisman making culture is more a combination of wording like spelling and having read, um, write, reading words over a certain material and then doing a process for example you want somebody to fall in love with you you give you pray on some seeds and give it to a chicken chicken poops and give the poop to the plant and the plant grows and then you make a soup and give it to the lover and he falls in love with you and this process is just so, <laughs> so not making sense but at the same time it does because that's the only way it can happen. And I started thinking about how the process is actually twisted and has like a detour towards this thing. Instead of you dressing up and having some social skills and approaching the guy and I don't know, like, or 
it just happens in the weirdest way from the from another like a detour and i was just like this is a little bit like art this is a little bit like the way i think about things i am not sure if this new audience of mine are gonna like my work but i don't have any chance anyway i have to just send out my things and see if they can communicate so i started just I don't want to say pretend, but I started just thinking, okay, I only have some clay and I have my words and people keep telling me that, oh, you're this Farsi, what does it mean? This is Persian. Maybe you're saying this because of you're coming from this country and maybe your hair is like that because you wore a hijab and all those things. And I was like, this is nonsense. What I'm going to do is that I'm going to put some clay in my mouth and just speak on it and give it to you and say, this is my sculpture. And I did that. And then I was, yeah, so I made those tokens and I was basically giving people around me this idea that it doesn't matter what I'm saying. It doesn't matter what language I'm talking about. This is just my mouth. And these are some words. And at some point I was pretending that I'm just saying very secret things. <laughs> and, um, and just combining them with some found images. Um, to... I wanted to ask you about your images. Yes. Where do they come from? Do you, are you always collecting? I'm always collecting online. I keep growing and growing this pile of images that I have. Um, at the beginning, I was more focused on concepts which is like it started from something and then that's how the internet works. Like you start somewhere and then it takes somewhere else and somewhere else and somewhere else. And rhizomatically you end up somewhere you could never guess. Um, that is still the logic behind the relationship of some of the pieces. But at some point I started thinking about them for more connections about the past about how uh, what happens when uh, a moment or an event is belongs to the past how far are we going down and how level do we make things that are in deep different um matter of time together um and yeah um i just add to the things i don't even categorize them because um I think it's gonna limit me from um, making new things. Um, so I just pile them and this is how I work in the studio. I just, when I'm making something new, I just have piles of images around me, um, just playing with them, putting some away and putting some in until I realize that this is happening. It almost feels like, especially with the casts of the mouth, um that like that's a way of almost indexically referencing the present tense right it's like the body is here and the mm -hmm. images like it, especially in terms of like having a relationship to the past um it often feels in your work like it's not just about what history means it's like how do like how do you literally deal with these with this past through imagery in terms of like a body which is material and exists in a present tense, like, um, which is a really interesting way of thinking about um, materiality and also just how you convey time in art even. Um, I don't yeah, know. I, I was wondering if um, you could talk about how in a lot of your work, there's almost evidence of your process. So and also using materials in a way that are unexpected. So like, you know, the way like you use plaster as like a, and you dip an image and you just press it in instead of casting and like you leave the brush in the image and then take a photo. Um, okay. And how people are reading this like um, work when they see it. Um, yeah, I guess, um, different elements started coming into my work at different points. Um, I was not intending to show the process. Um, 
I think that kind of happened because I was rethinking about the way I was thinking about the process when I was back in Iran. For me, um, for both reasons of coming from a graphic design background, but also coming from like that culture, making art was never like this. Making art was more like, I have an idea and I'm gonna make it. So I have the idea, I go buy things for it, and then I make it and I put it in the gallery. Um, studio practice, the way that I experienced here in my masters and later after was, was not like this um, back then. And I think I have different reasons to think about it. I'm not sure if I'm right, but I think one reason is that um, um, material is something different. Um, I think material is never taken as a political thing um, in my, in where I come from. I don't, I don't think, I'm not sure how to phrase this, but I think um, I started thinking about material in a polit political way when I moved to the US, not meaning that I'm um, making, making anything with a subject of um, political matters, but thinking about like that the material is basically generating what I'm making and is giving meaning to what I'm making, not the other way around. And this was a huge thing for me thinking about. And I think, um, so the more I started thinking about it, the more my choices about the material became very self-aware and specific. Like I felt like I, while I was cropping the images to prepare them for a photo, I realized that why am I discriminating the margin <laughs> of the paper? I want to put it in. And, or while I was just like collecting pieces to take photos from them, I suddenly realized that something is sitting out there that maybe it deserves attention. So it, I was not intending to show the process. I was um, thinking about what is worthy for us to see. Um, and yeah, so like the studio material, such as brushes, um, I don't know, like metal wires, um, can of paints, paints and glues and stuff like that, they have become something, they're elements that I'm um, putting there, but they're not really doing anything. They're not making anything. And I guess in some of my photos, it's like a stage photography that the main actors are the images and not the tools. Mm. Um, They're also kind of always like the potential of in being in flux. Mm -hmm. And I think also I was thinking of that one piece you made um, where you actually, you built a pool and you had this printer on top and the printer was constantly printing things and going down into the pool. Yeah. This is always changing. And I feel like with the photographs, you're also like, kind of like, oh, this could, just be like one moment and then change, you know. Um. We also noticed that like you use a ramp for that to go into water, but then you have another piece as well that ramps. Do you want to talk a little bit about your, uh, your obsession? <laughs> your obsession with ramps and water? <laughs> well, um, the ramp, I, don't, I, I have to think, I, when you ask this question, I mean, um, I think about like how, I think I've been a little bit dismissive about what ramp is being used in architecture generally. I need to really think about this. But um, thinking about ramp or river, because usually I use the ramp as like, there is like a certain drip of water or um, liquid clay coming down. Um, I think it's more about like a path or a way of controlling which is not necessarily controlled. Like this narrow path that is like trying to control something that is not really controllable like water. And um, this one uh, that I made it in Iran in at O Gallery, um, it has the same title as the show has and it's called, You Cannot the Same River Twice. 
um, the sentence doesn't have a verb. The original sentence is you cannot uh, step into the same river twice, which is like a sentence by, I think, Heraclitus or a very old ancient Greek philosopher that is um, mentioning the time almost for the same t for the first time, saying that you cannot step into the same river twice, meaning that it's not going to be the same. Um, and I deleted the verb because um, I was at that point, I was thinking a lot about um, hybrid being, how to, like, how language is authoritarian and like ordering us what to do and how the verb is, verbs are the patriarchic figures in the language and it just killed the verb, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, and um, it is some sort of very slow, but um, kind of a performance that I don't need to be there <laughs> for, you know, it happens and like things will slide down and then it becomes a little bit in motion. And I think they just add to the narrative. Like what's happening is that things are coming from this place to that place. And I don't have to be there. So I'm pretty happy about that. <laughs> also in your one piece, the pool actually froze because it was so cold. So then your images were like stuck. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was resin actually. I didn't know it was water when I first looked at it. Yeah. People were like, oh my God, this is, and I was like, what do you think? I don't have that much money to fill the whole pool. I know. Wait, Gabby, can you pull up an image of the piece? Yeah, I'm going to share a video clip and just... Oh, great. I just wanted to wait for y'all to finish up. Give me a second. Everything takes its time. Okay. Maybe I have to restart it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so that was one clip. So this is the pool when it's frozen. That looks like ice. Um, were those all found images as well or those yeah yeah these are all found images and we wrote with i mean a friend of mine helped writing a um program for the printer to take um snapshots like screenshots from a computer that was behind that la uh, ladder mm -hmm. and send it to the printer and the printer prints it every 15 minutes and the screenshots were taken all from a video that I made and this was basically found images too but there are certain elements that are being repeated um, both in the video and the images that are you can find in the pool like hands chaos a lot of them are right um, um, images from uh, very old um, paintings sometimes, um, different things, but uh, yeah, there are certain elements that are being really repeated. So I wanted to um, bring that up again because one of the things that you and Constanza talked about was the relationship between um, or the idea that repetition, a uh, repeated image or repeated form can become um, abstract enough or can become an abstraction um, of the thing itself, uh, which allows you perhaps to have a, a different kind of perspective, either on the image or on a specific kind of history. Um, and you talk about this process in relationship to poetics and the making of poetry. And so 
Um, I wanted to ask you what you're thinking about repetition and also about um, the relationship that the work has to poetry, which I think is like really, um, I think is really very strong. Like even the way that you were just talking about certain kinds of repeated imagery or like image rhyming, like picking out hands or picking out colors, right? Or being aware of um, the, the framing devices and seeing images as content and maybe like the scraps as, um, as like the form or the paper, right? You give us the whole sense of, of the structure of meaning and also allow us to see language both in terms of content and in terms of these smaller parts. Um. Yeah, I think for the repetition, I, I think I kind of realized, um, I probably took it, I probably have been thinking a lot about poetry. Um, you know, when you repeat a word and it loses its meaning, while you're just repeating and repeating it and it suddenly becomes something else, then you, you suddenly feel like, why do we even call this that? Like, it is just, it's just, it's not falling apart, but it's becoming something else. Um, while if you say just once within a context, it just makes relation to the other things. Mm. That's how I've been thinking about images. Um, the relationship of, I, I, some, I see my words, my works as texts. And I think, I'm, I'd be very happy if people think of them as reading them when they read them. Meaning that I think the words being floating, some of them are in relationship with the others as if words are being in relationship with the others in a sentence or a line of poetry, better say. But sometimes you emphasize on certain words and you emphasize on certain things to, to provoke the drama I guess um, but yeah I think that's that's how I've been thinking about the repetition um, like as a point of stress or a point of like accent um, within the whole um, thing. I wonder uh, hearing you talk about it in this way makes me um, think about what you said about the other piece, that it was a performance that could happen while you weren't there. Mm -hmm. um, and that feels uh, directly related to how the printer makes these images that yeah. continue to populate this pool when you're not there. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk about the relationship between, or like what your presence or lack of presence how you're thinking about that in the sculptures? Um, yeah, I rather my sculptures for, forget me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, that's been something about the way I've been thinking about work in general, because you know, a lot of conversations about art are very much identity oriented. They're a lot about like who you are and if we don't know, we don't understand your work. Mm. I thought, knowing, this is my in interpretation, I thought knowing about people's identity, knowing about who they are, what they've been through and knowing their, um, you know, anecdotes and life stories are going to help us to um, when we see another situation like that we can understand we can understand the other I thought this is this is what's happening but sometimes I find my identity to be a shield and a wall basically in front of my work to be understood I sometimes realize that people need to need to as soon as possible know that oh she's a woman she's from Iran she's like this age um she's been through this and this she has seen a war and um she's a she was born after a revolution da 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 da, da. so her work has to be perceived like this and 
I want them to forget this. <laughs> Not that I'm denying it. I just sometimes feel like there is a strong thing against um, standing in front of my work. This is where my, the title of this talk is coming from. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Talented yet unresolved. <laughs> I did this piece of the pool piece. Um, the, the show was picked uh, to be uh, in a critic panel at Brooklyn Library and um, so um, um, it was among a lot of like uh, three other artists all of them were super well known one of them was in Guggenheim one of them was uh, Anna Schultz um, I was like oh my god they like my work and then when the panel came up I only realized that um, people are talking about how they didn't understand anything and one of them was saying that, oh, it was so cold, I couldn't stay in. One of them was like, mm, I didn't understand. And one of them was, one of the critiques was like, oh, I went on her website and I saw some um, videos. She's talking about how she came out of Iran and what is this and all of that. And I understood something, but I, at the end, I think it's not there yet. I think she's very talented, but it's very unresolved. And... At that moment, I was slapped in the face. But then suddenly I felt such a relief. I was like, yes, exactly, I am unresolved. Like, of course you think that way. Because you were expecting something that you're not seeing there. And you were expecting me to give you something that you have a pre-image from. You wanted, you, you were looking at this work and searching for where is, she, where is her Iranianness? Where is her like suppressed woman thing? Where is it? It's all there, I'm telling you. But it's probably not the way you wanted this to be seen. And um, yeah, I, I'd be happy to not be there, really. Um, I wanted to sort of ask about the difference with the contemporary art scene in Iran based here and sort of the conversations that um, you're having with the artists in comparison or in the art world there. Um, I don't know how much conversation I have or if anyone is interested to talk to me <laughs> from there. But um, the last time I was involved was um, I think right before the quarantine that I was invited to be one of the um, judges of selection, selecting works that are being submitted to the, the International Biennial of Sculpture in Tehran. That never happened. Um, I mean, we, we, did, we went through the um, uh, selecting um, process, but it never happened eventually. And it was after a long time that I was seeing works by like younger generation people because there were a lot of submissions. Um, so I think in general, I would say that the academia in Iran is pretty much still um, thinking about a sculpture in a very classic and modern way. Mm -hmm. Like meaning that um, normal, like making things, and you have to like think about a sculpture is really like working with plaster and then stone and then building this and building that and making this object and giving it away. Um, and fortunately, a lot of the younger generation now is using alternative educations to educate themselves, such as internet. They watch a lot of. Instagram things, contents. Um, there are a lot of private institutions uh, that people gather, talk about um, other people's work, artist talks, a lot of things. But um, something that I think is still pretty much disturbing is that the country is closed. Mm -hmm. The doors of the country is closed to the rest of the world and the other way around. Sometimes there's like a little window open, somebody jumps in or somebody jumps out, but overall, 
you have to see things like you have to be able to travel and because of the visa stuff and the passport issue travel bans and the sanctions and what is happening right now people do not have access to the well, they're cutting off internet too right it's like every single day the challenges we have to go through is so much that i sometimes feel like how do people i mean i was one i was once one of them of course but i sometimes feel like this is really energy taking and eventually like how many what artist talks do you want to watch like how many things do you want to see over the internet you're not in the space physically and at the same time you have to deal with the censorship mm -hmm. like you have to think about ways to say things without being arrested how would you want to do this and, and there are many 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 reasons for you to get arrested and um, well i was gonna this week i saw a lot of the no execution this moment because they're like trying to execute some protesters um yeah um yes um so i think the question of how can you continue making art when things are very urgent like you need to hashtag this thing otherwise you wake up in the morning and this person is it right um, it's changing a lot of things at the same time i think there has been um different subject matters that has uh, people have been working on within the last three decades at least uh, i can mention to after the revolution like there are some political works meaning that the subject matter is political issues there, there are some um, female uh, sculptors that are make, that are addressing the gender, the issues of the female, the body, um, and um, people who are thinking about sculpture as um, like a time-based medium, thinking about installations, um, thinking about performance. Um, but as I'm saying, the limitation of censorship and Basically, his job is, um, you know, leading the things in a certain way. And then it, when you come here, and how, what's it like to be an Iranian in America, <laughs> which is like another challenge, I imagine, right? Um, one of my main challenges were like what I said about like how sometimes I find my identity to speak before me, and I, and I don't like it. Um, and others is like, it's very difficult that, um, sometimes you find yourself being, that uh, you have to criticize certain things in here and certain things in there, but then uh, you suddenly feel like you're, you don't have much voices and there are not many people thinking like you. I mean, um, we grew up being told that the U.S. is our main enemy. We grew up going to schools, had to be walking over the U.S. flag every day. Um, but some of the families, like my family, I was fortunate that at home I was told that it's not like this. This is not, this is not how we think. Uh, this is not how we think about things. And my mom taught us how to go around the flag. My mom taught us how to, because um, in the beginning, in the mornings, when you were about to go to the classes, you had to shout like, I love the Supreme Leader and God bless him and stuff. And my mom taught us that you don't have to say it, you can stay quiet. Um, I was fortunate, but I guess for a lot of people, it's been a self journey to be able to get the way of thinking that they want to. Um, and being in here, um,
I mean, I know that um, New York is very different. I don't know how all the country, because this is like a huge country. I don't know. I'm sure that there are like um, certain understanding of Iranians because of the years of the media and thinking about like all Iranians are the same the way, the same way that Iranians sometimes feel like all the Americans are the same. Um, but I mean, I love it overall. <laughs> Sharzad, well, I first wanted to say if anybody has questions, now's a good time to send them. Um, but I was going to ask you as well um, how you're thinking about um, politics, even with a little p, you know, like not like proclaimed, but just either specific politics or politics in general inside of aesthetics um, and inside of your, your work. Because I think there's a way... Um, that you could talk about things being unresolved, both in terms of, um, like both in terms of this idea that things are becoming, like things are being used, their language, but also literally because um, the objects themselves point to kind of like refuse being finished in a, like in an intentional way. <laughs> like they expose this idea that finish is something which might be oppressive or might just be wrong. Um, but I was wondering if you could talk about um, whether and how politics comes into your understanding of making art and aesthetics. Um, or maybe it doesn't. That's cool, too. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think um, politics is for now, it's not going to be the subject of my work. Um, I'm not going to make something that is pointing to a specific event or specific, like, they're killing the three men. I'm going to make a work about this. I can't do this. I know some people can't. I cannot do this. Um, for me, things need to be understood and it takes time for me to be able to process them and make something out of them and things that are happening in my life as an Iranian living abroad are too fast <laughs> They're too fast it's like ev every single day something happens and I cannot keep up and I cannot digest and make these things um, as artworks um, and I also think I'm gonna be vocal about them. I'm gonna be talking about them. I'm going to, like when the travel ban happened, for example, a lot of people find a way to, we were like, I was getting invited to a lot of shows and I was like, if you wanna show one of my previous works, I'm glad to give it to you, but I'm not gonna make a work about travel, but I, I can't do this. It's not a writing subject, like, um, and I think it matters because different mediums are created for different things. Like sometimes you need to write an article in a journal, in a newspaper to talk about things. And um, however, I think about politics a lot and I think about what's going on a lot. And I think about um, how lives change um, because some other people making some other decisions and they're out of control, like things get out of control. I think this is probably my main thing. <laughs> and, um, and I think it's coming back to my works. It's like there are certain situations that I need to take them in control and then I fail. I sometimes fail. I'm not really failing. What happens is that I'm I think there is like, hopefully there is a humor in this. There is a, uh, <laughs> something funny about this. They, they, they want to be out of control and I don't let them and I think that I'm in order, but I'm not. Um, uh, so in, in this way, yeah, it is political. In this way that I refuse to, I refuse to make presentable 
things while I was studying in a fancy, expensive school. I think it was a little bit political. The way that I um, probably just used printed papers, of found images, um, and things that you can just like, you know, they're about to uh, be trashed. I think it is, it is the way that I think about politics and thinking about it, what uh, we focus at and what we, how we direct our um, investments in general. We have a question mm -hmm. from Ketter. Uh, hi, Sharzad. With a nod to the future, can you talk a little bit more about your show at Transmitter? Yes. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm thinking about an installation. Um, I'm talking with uh, the curator uh, that offered the show um, and We've been talking about how um, uh, it's kind of like probably an extension to the pool, uh, uh, meaning that at, at the pool, it was more like uh, a flat surface that images are floating in it, but this one is probably like a path that you walk through it and you see the images surrounding you. And thinking about like how in a post-COVID situation, the bodies need to be distanced, need to be in move, not really staying somewhere. And I've been thinking that how, it's not a big space, it's, it's like a radically small room, but you can walk through it and just come out. And I've been thinking a lot about like, somehow you're walking through a slideshow maybe, um, or thinking about like, um, how you're just seeing like probably like a section of movie or like images just repeating after each other. These are the things I'm thinking of. Well, it's kind of interesting now because I feel like every space that you have to go into outside your apartment has like some kind of signage of how you're supposed to move. <laughs> and there's always like the tapes, even on the sidewalk and you like have to think like, oh, should I stand on the tape or not? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that's a good place to end the formal sort of part of the talk and so thank you again Sharzad and um, I hope everyone can stay and hang out and talk for a little while and feel free to unmute yourself and just continue the conversation as you um, as you wish. Um, next week? Oh but yeah. One of that leaves, yeah? Next week, we're having a conversation with um, Lauren Britton and their collaborator, um, Isabel Parr. Um, and they've been working on a project about melting as a metaphor and making kind of a melting dictionary and also visual projects around um, ideas about melting in society. So come join us. They're phoning in from Berlin. So <laughs> it'll be fun. I think 6 p.m. next week um, to account for the time difference. Um, and the week after that um, is a conversation with Michael Marcel, who was here. I don't think he's here anymore, but his work is yeah. amazing. So come and hang out.